like that. You guys like that? I don't like that. I, I'm good. I, we play. We can play that every time I come up, and I will. I know that's what y'all are thinking every time I come up here. Y'all are like, Hallelujah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Going to be in Luke chapter 18 today, so go ahead and flip over to Luke chapter 18. Going to read a parable there about two different kinds of people. Words are on the screen if you want to follow along there. Hopefully you can uh, find it in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one somewhere close by. Grab it. Uh, if you don't own one, that's your gift. Uh, please keep it and take it home with you. I want everybody to have a Bible. Uh, so we're going to be in Luke 18. It says this, Luke 18, verse 9. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Um, <clears throat> there are four types of people who often show up at church, or at least I'm going to put you in a category. One, you know, just to... If it makes you feel uncomfortable, I apologize, but I'm just going to, I'm going to lump you guys into categories here, all right? Four types of people that show up at church. The first one is the super spiritual religious person, where like you're like K-love all day long, right? Like in the office, in the car, you read your Bible as soon as you wake up in the morning, you fast every day, um, you're a super religious, spiritual person, and the rest of us need to be more like you, or at least you think we should. Um, then there is the semi-religious person, and that person is the person who comes to church, uh, the person who will pray when they feel like they need to, they'll read their Bible when they feel guilty, and um, yeah, that's a pretty good description. Uh, and then, uh, but, but they're not overly spiritual. They, they go to church, they, they do those kinds of things, but it's just kind of another thing they do. It's not necessarily a part of uh, how they identify themselves, maybe, uh, as much. And then there's the non-believer, the person who's just kind of curious and searching, and they just kind of show up at church curious and searching, which is good. We're glad you're here if you're one of those people. And then the fourth one is what I would consider the Christian sinner. The Christian sinner, the one who feels like they're not ever good enough, who often feels unwelcome, uncomfortable, unloved, and yet believes that Jesus died for their sins. So these are the four different groups. I don't know which one you fall into. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, but one of the things that I love about this parable from Jesus is he just tells us the group that he's talking to. Um, and the group that Jesus is talking to, uh, he says, is uh, those who, who ultimately put a lot of confidence in their own righteousness. Put a lot of confidence in their own righteousness. And look down on everyone. Now... This happens a couple of different ways. There are actually two groups of people that go to church that do this, but they do it differently. The two different ways in which this happens is there is the judgmental group of people, and then there's the people who hold others in contempt. Okay? This, this is kind of the juxtaposition between the two. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a small excerpt from Larry Osborne's book, uh, Accidental Pharisee, or Accidental Pharisees, and, and read it to you. 
uh, and just see if this seems to make sense with you. This is kind of, I think, how uh, people begin to put too much confidence in their own righteousness. He says, don't miss the distinction between judging people and showing contempt. It's important. It still happens today. Those of us who have been or have a bent toward a rigid and rule-based expression of our faith tend to judge and condemn those who don't follow our rules or match up with our standards. I love the fact that he's very clear that he says that they are our rules and they are our standards. Now, we do get them and we adhere to them probably because we see them somewhere in the Bible or we believe that they are good things to do because we were taught as Christians this is something you should do. But ultimately, they are not law-bounding and they do not save us. He's very clear about that by distinguishing them as our things, by our standards and our rules. And then he goes on, he says, at times, we can even wonder if those people are genuinely saved. Meanwhile, those who consider these rules and standards unnecessary tend to look with disgust and contempt upon those who insist on keeping them. And we chalk them up as uptight and narrow-minded. We have no right to judge people whom God accepts, and we have no right to look with contempt upon people whom God loves. And this, I think, is who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to people who have put confidence in their righteousness, their own righteousness, to the point that they would be judgmental or to the point that they would show contempt towards someone else and their expression of faith in Jesus. Now... I want to just talk for a second about my struggle, okay? Because I'm not, I am not foreign to uh, not dealing with these struggles. I'm not going to stand up here and be like, by the way, that's a problem you guys have, but that I don't have, okay? <laughs> well, as, I was, as I was preparing for this talk, I was like, am I preaching to myself today? Is that, is that what I'm doing? Uh, so when I took the Myers-Briggs indicator type, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, uh, personality assessment tests and that kind of things, but Myers-Briggs, it kind of breaks things down into 16 different personality types based off of uh, you can fall into uh, two different categories um, in, in four different areas. And so uh, basically you can be introverted or extroverted, you can be uh, intuitive or sensing, you can be thinking or feeling, and you can be perceiving and judging. And on the first three of those, um, I kind of fit like right down the middle. Like if you look at the bar graph that goes to one side or the other, like I'm not like an overly extrovert person. Uh, a lot of people think that I am uh, because in groups of people, I'm pretty comfortable. But I also am really comfortable just being by myself. And so, like, I kind of I kind of lean just slightly to one side, right? And that's the way it works for the first three sides of those categories. I'm just like, it's like there's, like, barely a little line, like a little notch on the bar graph going in one direction or the other for the first three. And then you get to perceiving and judging, and I perceive nothing and I judge everything. <laughs> it goes from, like, there's, there's just, like, a huge black line going toward judging. Like, um, and so... You can kind of know which one I, I struggle with, right? And I've been this way for a really long time. I, 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 uh, I've recently come to terms with it, uh, but I've been this way for a really long time. I remember looking back in high school and just judging people for the way they chose to live their life and do things. And, I, and I've done this, uh, I did it in college, and I did it at my first job, and my second, and third, and fourth, and I'm no longer working in any of those places. Um, and... And so I, I, I have I've just carried around this judgmental aspect of where I've, I've judged you. And I've judged those outside of the church. And I've judged my friends. And I've judged other parents. And I've judged my parents. And I've judged other pastors. And I've judged my wife. I've judged my kids. And it's a problem. And I know it's a problem because it just kind of happens. It just kind of comes out. And it's oftentimes not something I'm super aware of until the Holy Spirit or someone being used by the Holy Spirit makes me aware of it. And for a long time, I've really thought that I had the, the Bible and Jesus on my side when it came to this sin. Because I always love to quote Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 through 20. 
This is my defense for being judgmental. Here it is. Ready? By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do, not, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I was recently talking to a friend of mine about my struggle with being judgmental. He's a, he's a pastor uh, as well. And I was talking to him about my struggle with, with being judgmental. And I told him, you know, I really believe that all I'm doing is looking at people's lives and basing my determination based off of their fruit. And his response was so good. He said this. He said, Derek, as a leader in the church, your job is to look at the fruit of people's lives and determine if they can be trusted with the things God has put in your care. It is not only your job, but it is your duty as a shepherd. However, we have to be careful that wisdom doesn't lead to pride. Because it is also your duty to not become puffed up and so prideful that you wash your hands of helping people bear good fruit. That same day, I had a conversation with my dad about my struggle with being judgmental. And uh, my struggle also that, like, I actually also feel judged a lot of the time. Wrongly judged. <laughs> and my dad reminded me of words that are in that same chapter that I like to quote as a defense for my judgment. Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, Do not judge you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. In the measure you use, it will be measured to you. My dad looked at me and said, Son, what you're experiencing is the measure you have used towards others coming back on you. And if it hurts you, and I know it hurts you, know that it hurts others too. And you're just getting what you have given so whatever you can do to stop judging others, you need to do it. Now, I use myself as an example, not because I'm like holy, but because I'm not, and I'm trying to prove that. Um, and um, in reality, I, I, as studying this passage, like it really did hit home with me because I feel like I am, I am right there. There are many times that I've become an accidental Pharisee. And hopefully, I don't know, but maybe by my example of failing miserably at doing what Jesus' story talks about, or maybe just looking at Jesus' story himself, we can all kind of look in our lives and see the places where we've put too much confidence in ourselves, too much confidence in the way that we think about things or the way we do things, whether it's we put too much confidence in our biblical knowledge or our biblical interpretations or our politics, or our morality, our righteous behavior, our parenting, you name it. There are a number of different things that we can ultimately, we can place, or we can put our faith in ourselves and how we go about doing things and lose sight of God's grace. Now, it's important that I point out also that there are some times where you have certain understandings about what you're doing and they're accurate and sometimes they're not. And, and there's also, there's truly nothing wrong with feeling like you're making progress following God or becoming more righteous. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with feeling like, oh, I'm growing as a follower of Jesus. I'm becoming a more righteous person. I'm moving further and further away from sin as I move closer and closer toward God. There's nothing wrong with, with realizing that, understanding that, and being excited about that. Yet to put too much confidence in that, to put too much confidence in our growth and our behavior, that it causes us to see other people in the church of Jesus Christ as lesser, immature, unsanctified, stupid, arrogant, pompous, any of those other labels is a sin. And inevitably will knock us down, if not knock us out. A lot of times the things that lead to this type of sin are not actually bad things. 
the things that actually lead us to judge other people are actually, we're trying to do good stuff. And yet we're just unaware of what's really, really taking place. And as we make progress, we lose sight of what's most important, which is the grace of Jesus Christ. And I think that that is how judgmental nature sets in, honestly. Like most of us probably aren't aware all the time of our judgmental thoughts or ideologies. It takes something like this conversation we're having right now uh, to make us aware of it a little bit. And, uh, and we hold on to this, though, and we carry it through our lives, and it causes us to behave in a negative way toward, toward other people. And I imagine the same is true in this story. Uh, see, Luke tells us that Jesus is speaking to people who are confident in their own righteousness, but I think it's important that we don't automatically assume that they knew their struggle. Now, we often read this assuming that Jesus is putting uh, the, the, the righteous person in their place. And he does that sometimes. He calls the, the Pharisees broods of vipers. He calls uh, one of his own disciples, Satan, and says, get behind me. He'll put people in their place at times. But oftentimes, more oftentimes, what Jesus does when he tells a story is he asks the listeners to open their eyes and open their ears to see if the shoe fits. To see if we can put ourselves in the story and if maybe he's talking to us. So Jesus tells stories like this not to condemn, but to convict and bring about change of heart. And I think it's important that we understand that. Because Jesus does say, for those who open their ears, we talked about this in week one of this parable series, those who open their ears and open their eyes to what Jesus is really saying, he will heal them. And so there's hope for us. There's hope for all of us. No matter what we really struggle with. He talks about the one who walks away justified. And he uses that word justified. He uses the word righteousness. And it, and it sets kind of this stage of, 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 uh, in, of being in a courtroom. And being uh, proclaimed um, ultimately not guilty. That's, that's kind of the idea. That you've been justified. Um, and Jesus says that it's the, it's the one who, who beats their chest and says, like, God, I'm a, I'm a sinner, have mercy on me, that walks away justified, that walks away right with him. This is what uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, Paul's talking about being justified by our faith and belief in Jesus and not by our own righteousness, not by our own works. And he says this, he says, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I've asked this question to you before, but I'm going to ask it again. You know what the word all means? All. It means all. Yeah, it means all of us. So we're, we're in good company. It means none of us have a leg up on anyone else. That's what Jesus is trying to say here. So no matter how great you live in step with God's word, no matter how often you go to church, no matter how many times a week you fast, or, um, or how often you pray, or how often you don't have a leg up on anyone. Because none of that is what justifies you. What justifies you is the grace and mercy and love of Jesus Christ displayed in Him coming and dying on the cross for our sins and us putting our faith that because of that work that He did, not the work that we do, makes us right with God. And Jesus, what He is calling us to, is He's calling us to look upon other people with compassion and grace because He looks upon people. He looks upon you and me with compassion and in grace. He wants us to look upon the world with compassion and grace. And this is something I feel like the church has really struggled with for a really long time. And again, I think the intention has been good in a lot of cases. The intention has been not to give in to some sort of way in the world or be overly influenced by a way in the world. And yet often I hear people in the church and I hear myself up here on stage and I hear other pastors talk about those in the world. You ever heard that phrase or used that phrase or thought that phrase? And I get it, right? Our world is very broken. But I promise you this, it will not be made whole by our self-righteous judgment and fear of it. We will not 
make the world a more Eden-like place if we, if we just seclude ourselves in fear that it might have some sort of influence in our life. Sadly, due to our judgment of the world, we often ask the question of how can I separate myself or how can we separate ourselves from the world as opposed to how can we invade it? We often think that like um, that, that we're supposed to move away from the world instead of to the world, yet holding to a conviction in our belief in Jesus. And we will not compromise on that. And we'll stay true to that. And, and yet, the, the truth is, our conviction, our belief in Jesus, um, we, we've, we've flipped it to where it's like it's caused us to move away from instead of move toward. And I believe that if we, we really want to be of, of good in the world, we have to go into the world, yes, maintaining that like we will not compromise our faith or our value or our way of life to try and be more like Christ, but we're going to live like Christ in the world, showing His love and His grace and His compassion and His goodness and His joy and His peace instead of just judging, instead of just condemning. And I believe... Where that all starts and our ability to actually do that, it starts right here. Like a lot of things when trying to follow Jesus, trying to make bigger impact or larger impact in the world, a lot of times we have to start really close to home in order to do that. Meaning that we have to be able to share the love of Christ, the joy, the compassion, the peace, the grace with one another. You know, the phrase one another is the most repeated phrase in the New Testament. We must be committed to one another, united to one another. We must love one another over and over and over again. We have to show grace to one another. We have to give the benefit of the doubt to one another. We have to forgive one another. We need to move toward one another. And I think if we can begin to do this sort of thing and begin to move toward one another in a way like this in the church, uh, we're, we're, we're truly becoming more Christ-like. I mean, this is what emotionally healthy, um, emotionally healthy disciples and emotionally healthy churches do. They stop trying to read people's minds and they sit down and have a cup of coffee with them. And they listen to each other's hearts. And in, that doesn't mean that we're going to walk away from that coffee table agreeing. But it will mean that we walk away from that coffee table unified by the blood and grace of Jesus. In fact, at that coffee table, we may actually call people to even question question and challenge their opinions and views that, that make them wonder and go back and, 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 and really wrestle with their ideology, their theology, their thoughts and their opinions. But that's not judgment. That's sharing our heart. That's sharing our struggle. And that's an emotionally healthy and good thing to do. And I think if if we take the time to do that, if we take the time to, to walk into that kind of relationship with other people uh, in the church, first and foremost, we'll be able to hear each other's hearts in a way that um, those we struggle to love, those that we often judge, those that we often show contempt toward, we can appreciate a little bit more. And that appreciation that we're missing as we judge and as we hold contempt and as we refuse to engage, um, oftentimes that, 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 that appreciation that's missing will be found if we can just sit down and listen. 
You know, a great way to get to a place where you are moving away from judgment, away from uh, condemnation, away from contempt, is to sit down and listen to someone else. Truly listen. Don't worry about solving problems or getting points across. Just listen. My, uh, Mallory and I, we, uh, our marriage counselor, he, uh, he gave us some really great advice recently and, and we were, uh, talking and he goes, he goes, he goes, do you guys have a way of like talking or saying something to each other so that the other person knows that they're not supposed to talk <laughs> in a conversation <laughs> or that they are supposed to talk in a conversation? And he goes, cause my wife and I, what we do is that like, she either says, I just need you to listen to me which means put your phone down, put everything else away, and just give me your full undivided attention. Or just have a way of saying like, hey, I need to process. It says that we use the word process. I need to process something with you, meaning I want this to be a two-way conversation. And, and so we're working on that at our house because we struggle with that. Okay? We struggle with like, oh, well, like I'm going to, oh, I think she's thinking this. Or she's feeling that. And she may not be feeling that at all. Right, and so we're we're working through that kind of stuff. I like, but th there's something powerful if somebody says, "Hey, look, I just, I'm just gonna listen." There's something powerful and freeing in that kind of thing. And so here's what I want to challenge you to do. Some of you can practice this with your spouse or your roommate. Uh, some of you could practice this with a coworker. Uh, some of you could practice this with your core group or your life group or uh, with someone else here at church. Um, but I want you to connect with someone. I want you to connect with someone that you've judged or held contempt toward. And I want you to, whatever, uh, whatever you do, right? I, I just want you to, uh, whether, uh, but I, I, I want you to go into that place uh, and whatever you did or didn't do or whatever, um, I, just, I just want you to get to a place of where you can sit down with that person and, and you can listen uh, to them or them listen to you. That's it. And try not to get defensive. Try not to justify yourself. Just listen. That's really, really easy to say. It's really easy to say. It's really, really hard to do. Like legitimately, some of you right now, you're crawling in your skin. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> I get it. At the thought of, of that, you, you get this feeling of just angst. But I'm telling you, this is what followers of Jesus do. These are the kinds of things emotionally healthy disciples and churches do. And not only will we be better for it, but if we can do that with one another, our world will be better for it. But here's the other thing. I don't think you have to be in a hurry. I think that that's really key. It would be really probably pretty hard for you if you're just coming to grips with the fact that you have contempt towards someone else in the church or judgmental towards someone else in the church. It would be really, really hard for you to come to grips with that like here, right now, and then tomorrow, know who that person is, and then by Wednesday sit down and have a really healthy, good conversation. So just don't be in a hurry. You don't need to rush into something like this that's really, really serious. It may take a lot of time to work through this. It may take a lot of time to just kind of figure out how you can actually own whatever it is you need to own and uh, enter into a healthy conversation in a healthy way. And it might take a year. It might take a year of counseling where you walk into a counselor's office and you say, here's my goal, here's what I need to work on. I'm very judgmental or I hold contempt toward other people. And, and I, what I need to do is I need to get to a place where I can sit at a table with one of those people and listen to them out of love. That is not an easy work. But if that's what it requires and that's the time that it takes, that's okay. Recognize that, work through that, Get to a healthy place, whatever that takes. But here's the key. Stay committed to sitting down and having the conversation. Because if you don't, 
the longer and longer you go, the more easy it's going to be like, well, I don't really have this problem anymore, so I don't need to sit down and have the conversation. Or the more and more you work with it, the less and less it's going to feel like you have a problem, and so you're going to not want to sit down and have the conversation. And so it, they're, they're, the longer you go, the more likely you are to not actually do this. And, and I just want to challenge you, stay committed and faithful to the task of actually sitting down and having the conversation. Because it, uh, it won't be easy, but I think it's truly, truly good. Now, here's um, the, the last thing that I'll say about this parable that Jesus says. Uh, this is a parable that we use to describe humility a lot of the time. And we talk about humility, and we make humility the flagship idea, not necessarily being judgmental, although I think that, that both should be talked about. And so let me just talk about humility for just a second, and, 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 uh, because I think uh, we all have something to learn, especially those of us who are in those first two categories of like super spiritual religious or semi-religious people. Those people who are very judgmental and hold contempt against those others in the church. There's something we can learn from the person who shows up not feeling welcome and not feeling good enough and not feeling loved. At least, I think that's part of what Jesus' point is. Is that we can truly learn from someone who is humbled by the grace of Jesus again and again and again. See, humility is not as important as the source of humility. And the source of humility, the thing that leads to, to, to this humility is the fact that, like, God loves us, that He saves us, that He sends His Son to die on the cross for our sin. That's what makes us humble. That's what Jesus is calling us to get to a place of where we all can become a part of that fourth group of people who show up here all feeling unworthy, feeling not good enough, because the truth is, we're not worthy. The truth is, we're not good enough. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God says we are worthy. Because when He sees us, He sees Him. And so He sees us saved and redeemed. And if you feel unwelcome and you feel uncomfortable, I just want you to know you're not unwelcome. You are welcome here. You are, you are in the right place. Because the reality is, is we can all learn something from you. We can learn what it looks like to not put confidence in our own way, in our own righteousness but simply put our hope and our trust and our faith in, in Jesus Christ, a God who loves and a God who saves. And so I'm so glad you're here because we need you. We probably need you to stand up here and teach us instead of me. Because that's what true humility looks like. True humility looks like the one who every single day gets on their knees before God and is so grateful and has such gratitude that He loves them and saves them. Not because of what they've done or because of how good of a Christian they are, but because they've never been good enough. That's the one who walks away justified and right with God. And so as we enter a time of communion and reflection and repentance, I pray that this broken body and this shed blood, the, the bread and the cup, bring us back to a place of where we realize our need for a Savior. Bring us back to a gratitude that we have one. And truly humble us in light of who he is and what he's done. Because we don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. 
But he offers it freely to us anyway. So as you come, come humbled that he loves you, that he died for you, and that he rose for you, and that you no longer have to put your hope on your own righteousness, but you can put it in his righteousness, his perfection. His power, His mercy, His grace. That's why we come to the table. If you, for some reason, want to respond um, in some other way, maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you're in that, that third category of people that I talked about that show up at church. Maybe you're not a believer. You've never put your faith in Jesus. I want you to know that uh, if you're feeling moved by the Spirit, God's drawing you closer to Him. He's drawing you to respond in some way that says, man, I, I want to be forgiven. I want to have hope for eternity. Then I want to invite you to just come. And we'll walk you through what that looks like. If you're somebody who just needs prayer, maybe you're really struggling. Maybe you feel like you're that person holding contempt or judgment. And you just need some prayer and some guidance on how to um, rely on the Spirit in that. There would be some people at those back doors back there. Um, and I'll be right down here, down front, and be happy to pray with you. Um, or maybe, lastly, um, maybe, maybe you just need to let the Holy Spirit do it for you while you take communion and take the bread and take the cup and just let the Holy Spirit just convict you, change your heart, and be humble because of His goodness and His grace. And whatever it is, however you feel led to respond, I invite you to do that. Uh, as soon as I pray and um, so let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts to respond however God leads us God I thank you for just the uh, The truth that is in this short story, and just these few verses, how you can hit us right at home. God, I pray that you will forgive us and that we will repent from being judgmental and for believing that our own righteousness somehow means anything. God, forgive us for looking at other people and, and holding them in contempt. when they try to follow you and diligently pursue you in a way that seems strange to us. Help our hearts to turn away from ourselves, away from our way of thinking, God, and toward you. That we might be more like you in the way in which you extend compassion and mercy and grace, that we might know that, that as we turn from ourselves, we come uh, and, and we, we lock eyes with a God who loves us and saves us and invites us in, a God that we can approach with confidence, not because of what we've done, but because of what He's done. And so God, draw us to you. Call us to turn. Lead us closer to the heart that you have, that we might have that heart for others. God, be with us as we work, as we work to try and, and, and be more like you, as we, as we try to, 
to trust you and follow you. Keep us faithful. Keep us rooted and grounded in your grace and in your love. Convict us and change us. And thank you that although you want to change us and that you will convict us, God, that you will not condemn us, that you will not cast us aside if we call on your name, but that, God, that we can live in the joy of your salvation, the joy of your glory and grace. God, we love you. We truly, truly love you. Forgive us when we fail to embody your love for us. And we fail to show your love to others. God, we love you. Praise you. Thank you for Jesus. And pray all this in his name. Amen.